Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie and I am the reference librarian here at the Phillipsburg Library. Um, now this year for Maker's Day, unfortunately we can't have any in-person events uh, and we've already been doing a lot of take and make kits this year. So instead, uh, I've teamed up with our children's librarian, Miss Christina, and we're going to do a little video demonstration for you all today. Um, so recently my family welcomed home a new member and this new member of our family has inspired Miss Christina to revisit an old maker hobby of hers. So today we're gonna do a little science lesson and a little bit of, of maker demo. Um, so to start off that science lesson, I'm gonna introduce you to this new member of my family and she's gonna give a little genetics lesson with me. Okay, so here is Snowball. She is my family's new rabbit. She is a Holland Lop and <laughs> Uh, if you're familiar with Holland Lops, she may look a little bit different. She's got very long fur. Most Holland Lops are going to look a little bit more like this guy on this book right here with shorter coats. Uh, and a little bit of the history behind that is when they were first developing Holland Lops as a breed, um, they only came in solid colors and they wanted to be able to introduce a broken or multicolored pattern to them. So that's kind of like this little guy in this picture up here. So in order to do that, they introduced a different breed of a rabbit to the Holland Lop gene pool called the English Spot. This did successfully introduce the broken color variety into the Holland gene pool, but it also altered the texture of their coat in a way that they, they didn't want. Um, so in order to try to correct for this, they started breeding French Angoras into that Holland Lop gene pool. For the most part, that did correct the issue, however, it also introduced a recessive gene for this long woolly coat like what Snowball here has. Um, so just to show you what a French Angora looks like, here's a, here's a photo of a French Angora rabbit. So very similar coat to what Snowball has. And so most of the rabbits in the, in, that are Holland Lops are going to have uh, that short coat. And of those rabbits with that short coat, they can have two different genetic combinations. So you can have dominant genes and you can have recessive genes. And with a dominant gene, you only need one copy of that gene for that trait to be present. Whereas with a recessive gene, you need two copies. All right, so you can have different possibilities here. You can have homozygous dominant where there are two copies of that dominant gene. So a rabbit that has two dominant genes for short fur they're gonna have short fur, they can only produce offspring with short fur. There are also heterozygous dominant. So you can see the dominant is represented by the big F, the recessive represented by the small F. So that means that a rabbit that is heterozygous dominant is going to have short fur, but it can produce offspring with a long coat like what Snowball has. And you can also then have what is called homozygous recessive. So we got two small Fs here. So that means that it has two copies of that recessive long hair gene. So that's what Snowball here has. She has two copies of the recessive gene for long fur. However, both of her parents actually had short fur. So how did that happen? I'm going to show you a Punnett square that I made. All right, so these represent her parents, both heterozygous dominant. So for each of the babies in that particular litter, there was a 25% chance that they would have two copies of the dominant gene and they would be unable to have any offspring with long hair like snowballs. There's a 50% chance, two out of four, that they would be heterozygous dominant. That would mean that they would have short fur, but they would be able to have offspring with long fur like snowballs. And there was a 25% chance that that baby would be homozygous recessive. And that means that they have long fur and can only pass on that long fur gene to their offspring. Now, this is kind of the interesting part here and why uh, Snowball joining our family inspired Miss Christina to visit an old hobby. We have to brush Snowball every single day so that her fur does not get matted. And I'm gonna show you here, we have been saving this fur. This is just from one weekend of brushing. And what I've been doing is saving that fur for Miss Christina. Some of you may know Miss Christina loves to knit, um, but you can actually take rabbit fur like this and you can spin it into yarn. 
So now I'm gonna hand this over to Miss Christina and she's going to show you, unfortunately not with actual snowball fur. Um, we haven't had her long enough to have enough fur for Miss Christina to spin, um, but she is going to demonstrate the process of what she will ultimately be doing once we've uh, accumulated enough of snowballs fur. Um, so here she is, Miss Christina. Hi, I'm Christina and I'm gonna introduce you to hand spinning. Uh, to start out, I'm going to say I am not very good at this. I am a complete beginner. I tried this a couple years ago and I just picked it up again because that bunny is so fluffy and cute and there's so much hair. We wanted to see if I could do something with it. Uh, but that being said, I still have fun. Even though I don't always succeed, even though sometimes my yarn's a little funky looking, it's fun and so I'm going to keep going and I don't want you to be afraid to try new things. Everyone when they start out is a beginner. No matter how good or amazing someone is at something, they went through this too. Uh, they just got it over with a while ago. So don't be afraid to try something. So hand spinning is just turning loose fiber, can be from an animal, can be from a plant, into a finished product like yarn, thread, rope. Humans have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. And it was civilization changing technology. Being able to create rope and sail for a ship enabled people to travel beyond their shores, uh, being able to make clothing, being able to make thread. This changed everything, gave people more freedom to create and do, to stay warm. So it started out actually with people just hand twisting. Now this would be Paleolithic times. This is old technology, just twisting. It's kind of coarse, very simple, pretty inconsistent. And then cultures all over the world invented what's called the spindle. So this is a hand spindle. Something like this is found in every culture all over the world. It's a very simple tool. It's two parts. It's a spindle or a shaft and then a circular or weighted or round object that's on the bottom or the top that gives it weight, which gives it stability for when it spins. And it actually, because of the weight, it keeps spinning once you get it into motion. Things with that sort of drive, don't, they don't want to stop. So they take that effort that used to be done twisting that fiber and it automates part of it. Now there are spinning wheels and there are mills, like industrial mills for production that we have now, but they take up a lot of room and they are very, very, very expensive. So actually still today in developing countries, you will still see spindles in use because they are very portable. They're very cheap. You can actually just glue a CD to a pencil and that's a spindle. You have the two parts, you have the shaft and you have the whorl and you can make yarn. So, so this was my first spindle. It's a top whorl. It's heavy. Um, the joke is they call these drop spindles because when you're not doing it right, your yarn snaps and it drops. That's not really why it's called that. It's called that because it's suspended. Um, that's one of the types of spindles that are out there. Some are supported, some you rest on a bowl or on your knee. Um, this is the kind I have. And here's one I started. So I've actually only had this for four days. It's brand new to me. It's a completely different kind of spindle. Um, you see the weights on the bottom. And I'm actually have a ball of yarn started on the bottom. On this type, it actually will slide right off when I'm done and I can pull those legs out and I will have a little ball. This is a slow art. Um, it's actually very calming, uh, kind, of, kind of like meditating. Um, after a stressful day, it's kind of nice to come home and do this. Breathe a little deep, you have to go slow, you have to focus, um, but having that ball at the end saves me some time, which I appreciate. So all spinning is, is the pulling out of some loose bit of fiber to the thickness that you want to work with, and then introducing twist into it. And there's all sorts of details you can get into after that, but at the basic, that is all spinning is. And with a spindle, you set it spinning. So that. And all that twist that is being created by the spindle is getting stored in this length of yarn that I've already made. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull back on this fiber. I'm gonna let that sit. If you're really good at this, you can actually be doing both these parts at once. People can even walk around while they're doing it. They can wait in line. 
go for a walk with their family, and they will, because this does take time, and the more time you spend spinning, the faster you get done. So a light spindle doesn't spin as long, but I'm able to spin pretty fine. So I think I'm gonna actually make socks with this yarn when I'm done. That's always the hard part, is knowing what you're gonna do with your finished item. So I let it spin, all the energy builds up, and I can actually feel that. This is starting to feel very hard, and I can feel it pushing up against my hands. It wants out. There's too much twist here for that little bit of yarn. I'll park it, and I'm gonna pull back. So this fiber, it's a kind of wool, comes from a sheep. It's actually a crossbreed too, just like Stephanie's rabbit. And it's called Targi. It was created in Idaho, it was an American breed in 1926. Uh, the breeders wanted to create a sheep that produced a wool that had all the best qualities of the super fine wool. So those really buttery soft ones like Merino that you, you don't mind having up against your skin, but they wanted to combine it with a stronger long wool breed. So something more resilient, a little tougher, but still next to the skin soft. Really lovely breed. All right. So I've got a little bit of yarn here. This is what I can fit in the camera here. So once I have some wound up, I just want to put it on the cop here. That's what that's called, that little bundle of yarn on the spindle. So what I've spun here is called a single. So it's a single strand of yarn twisted in one direction. Oops, I'm wobbling. Like I said, I'm still learning to do this part. And I'm doing it the pretty way. So you can kind of see the gradient in the color. Um, you can do this the fast way too. Uh, but you know, for camera, making it pretty. So once I have spun all of this fiber into singles, and there's actually quite a bit more of it than this. This is about an eighth of the fiber I have for this bit of yarn. Uh, once I have that all done, and they're all going to spin in the same direction, I'm actually going clockwise. So it's stronger than it was as a fiber. I can pull on this and it will stay fairly secure, but I wouldn't want to wear this as something as socks the way it is, because it's not going to stand up to abrasion. It'll wear through. So what I will do once I have all these singles spun is I will spin two strands together, at least, going the other direction. So it's gonna unwind a little that spin I just put in, but by spinning in one direction and then spinning them together the other way, it's gonna become much, much stronger and more resilient. Uh, I'll be able to pull on it. It's not gonna break apart, but it also will withstand wear. So I will be able to say knit something like these mitts. So I didn't spin the yarn for these. I did spin the orange <laughs> and the yellow was from a friend of mine. So finished product out of what I make. This is long process, but I love it. It is calming. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can contact the library, but don't be afraid to try new things, even if they are completely outside of your experience. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Miss Christina for demonstrating the process of how to spin yarn for us. I hope that you learned something new today and I hope that maybe we have encouraged you to try a new hobby. Um, if you want to see more videos for New Jersey Makers Day, if you go to njmakersday.org and click on NJMD Live on Friday, March 19th and Saturday, March 20th, there are going to be some live uh, workshops that they're gonna be streaming on that page. And those videos will also be available for 30 days on demand. Um, and I also want to mention, um, I know that I showed off my pet rabbit snowball and I want to make sure that everyone understands that pet rabbits do require quite a bit of special care and attention. If you're thinking about getting a rabbit for a pet, I want to highly encourage you to do some research on what kind of care they require. So you can call us here at the library at 908-454-3712. We do have some books here about rabbit care that you could check out. You can also visit the House Rabbit Society at rabbit.org. Um, they have a lot of great tips and information about how to care for rabbits there. So we're gonna put links for both of those in the description for our video. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, and I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, Peaberg Library. We will continue to post more videos there with instructions on how to do some of our take and make crafts as well as our preschool story times. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day and I hope we'll see you again soon. Bye.